Welcome to episode 9 of the Heritage Langham podcast. I'm Heather Payton. This month, what we really found at the dig all is revealed. And reliving the past, how one man lost three stone in as many minutes. If you came to our Meet the Experts event last month, you'll have heard our tame archaeologist James Meek on the results of the dig at Great Nash Farm in April. What we were looking for, of course, was remnants of Flemish culture left behind by Langham's 12th century founders. And we did find some medieval pottery, of which more later. However, potentially even more exciting were reminders of a far earlier culture, flints, which it was thought at the time were from the Mesolithic period, so between 5,000 and 12,000 years old. James has since had them analysed with some fascinating results, which, as well as giving an insight into how our Stone Age ancestors lived, also tell us a lot about how archaeologists work. We've passed them under the nose of Andrew David, who, uh, formerly of English Heritage, who is very much a Flint expert, has done an awful lot of work in of Flint in Pembrokeshire. And he is fairly convinced that with the types of the material we're getting in the uh, the actual flint itself, that it's it's late Mesolithic. The material we're getting out is typically blade flakes. Now, they do run uh, late Mesolithic into the early, early Neolithic as well. But associated with that, we've also had these things that are called microliths, which are very small fragments of flint. They are worked and actually created into small shape. I mean, some of them are called scalene, gives an idea. They're little sort of almost triangular, very thin, very pointy bits. Now, they would have been used in uh, to have then been inserted into wood, like spearheads or harpoons, you know, and those, those individual bits of flint are then used in conjunction with lots of others to create the tool that they're after. We also had a couple of interesting long stone pebbles, beveled pebbles, that on site we kept them because we were fairly certain they must be something to do with this Mesolithic flint, Uh, but we weren't 100% sure, and giving them to Andrew David instantly thought that, yes, they were probably pebbles brought... um, collected probably because of their shape they're quite long and thin uh, probably with an end knocked off just to make them fairly flat on the one end and then those would have been used in the manufacture of the flint tools. So these people were hunter-gatherers obviously does that mean would this have been a settlement would have been would have been somewhere where they went seasonally or what? Well potentially it's a seasonal site uh, but uh, well, I was just chatting to somebody earlier on and, and made me think that, that what we got in conjunction with this was we were finding bits of hazelnut shell. Now, that that might mean, you know, they sat down for a single meal and, and it just happened to comprise hazelnuts and off they went. But actually looking at the material, and I say from this small area, we've got an awful lot of bladelets, shall we say, but they're not from the same piece of flint. So it's not one person sitting there with one nodule of flint knocking six bells out of it or seven bells out of it and uh, and then creating a single tool these are obviously you know laid down from quite a period of working now whether that means they were there for one season but we're talking about months of settlement uh, possibly or alternatively they as you say they could well have been returning there every year but it's certainly not just one event with one flint nodule and one person napping a bit and off they go. This seems to be a, uh, a, a more prolonged usage site. This site, of course, was a fair way inland and another Mesolithic site, um, also in Langham, was found much nearer the coast. What does all of that tell us? Admittedly, the other site seemed to be somewhat earlier, so we are talking of, we are talking of thousands of years apart, but... I mean, certainly with the the other site at Langham, that's nearer the coast and it's more typical of the sort of Mesolithic flint scatters as have been found throughout Pembrokeshire. They seem seem to be following watercourses or they seem to be on the coast coastal edge. What we're finding now with a lot of other, well, with the more sites that we're looking at is we are finding Mesolithic sites inland, away from any obvious major river source or you know the main water courses should we say and certainly the one at Great Nash that seems to be well unlike the typical sites somewhat atypical it's inland it's on a hilltop definite again seasonal occupation site Um, it's just showing us there there are so many more of those sites out there which we don't get the opportunity to look at when that's one of the reasons why Great Nash has been excellent you know for two reasons but you know lots of medieval pottery but then to find this undisturbed Mesolithic site 
hidden underneath, you know, buried, sealed underneath, mm. um, which I say quite often we wouldn't get the opportunity to look at. So it's, it's adding to our knowledge of the Mesolithic in Pembrokeshire. It's excellent, yeah. During the dig, we got very excited because we found lots of medieval fragments of, of pots, and some, some quite big ones, in fact. Now, you've actually had those analysed, haven't you? The general thought with the pottery is that the majority of the wares that we're getting are, as we thought on site, these things called dovid gravel-tempered wares, which are probably locally made vessels, cooking pots. They're not the... They're not the posh cookware, you know, it's not the, um, the, the stuff that you only get out for Sunday best. These are... These are your utilitarian stuff. It's the cooking pots. It's the the, the stuff that, that when it gets broken, it's heaped out on the uh, on the midden and they just go and purchase another one. Seems to be at Great Nash. We've got an awful lot of those cooking pots, which is, which is good. You know, it's showing kitchens. It's showing that they had a certain amount of wealth at the house as we would have anticipated. But also there are the occasional shirt we've been finding of the... The posher stuff, the, um, the, the, the material that's been imported in, the glazed material, ham green stuff from Bristol area, which is probably quite early as well. And I mean, all the pottery we're getting, the, the majority of this material is dating from probably the later 1200s through to the later 1400s. So there may be a bit of material that even predates the De La Roches, but with the way the pottery is dated, it you know, it's more, or, or could have just been carried on being in use uh, till Great Nash was actually set up. But nothing that we can say this was brought in from Flanders, ideally, but um, across the Channel. No, there was no material that we could say has come from the continent. But again, we have only dug a tiny part of that site. And so the material we've got is, is only limited to what we've seen in the trench. With the other material we've got, you know, there's obviously a lot a lot more there to be found. So th there is still a potential it's there. It's just unfortunately in our trenches we put in this year, we haven't found it. James Meek of Dufford Archaeological Trust and his dig diary remains on the Trust's website, showing all of us amateur archaeologists at work. One of the star events at Langham's recent carnival was the pageantry and sheer fun provided by Lanska Reenactment. To the casual observer, they appear to be a group of people who spend their time charging around on horses while pretending to be characters from history. That's doing them a grave disservice, of course. It's much more complicated than that, as you'll hear in a moment. As well as being stars of the carnival, they'll also be starring in the film of our research project currently being put together, which gave me an excuse to go along one day earlier this year to watch them practice. Will you join me on a hilltop in rural Carmarthenshire, a very windy hilltop. Seven members of the group on horseback and in costume are running, galloping through their routines under the eye of a trainer. And here, discipline is the watchword. These horses are big. And to an outsider, some of the moves look challenging to say the least. Their trainer needs to know what she's doing. Time to find out more. My name's Carrie Harris and I'm a part of Lanska Reenactment, which is a sister group of Reggie Rangalorum. Carrie, we heard you uh, shouting at him a moment ago. You, you sort of play the part of the Sergeant Major, don't you? I'd say more riding instructor. Okay. We are training at drill riding. Um, not all of our riders here today have done it before or frequently. So it's just a case of reminding them that they are to stay in line abreast and to encourage them to push on their horses when they need to. And it's actually quite serious stuff because these are big horses, aren't they? They are indeed. Our largest horse here today is 16.3 and our smallest is 14.2. Um, that's done in hands high and each hand is four inches. So they, they look, I mean, I know nothing about this, but they look to me like they're pretty expert at what they're doing, the riders. Are they? Some are, some aren't. We have got riders here from novice level right up to very skilled and experienced riders. Um, so I'm glad they all looked good. <laughs> they certainly did that. And um, how many have you got in the group all together? I think our local branch of Lanska has 15 members, although they're not all horse riders. We have members here today from all over the, all over the country, um, representing many different local groups of the larger Regio Angelorum Radfolk riding group. This is a training uh, day today. How often do you, 
do you do all of this? We try and train for the equestrian event at least twice a year. We have another. We are training here today at, uh, in Wales with the Welsh Horse Yeomanry, and we have another base where we go to in Yorkshire with Mark Atkinson. Um, we, we try and get together as often as we can. And what does that turn out to be? Every weekend, every month, what? Because we are quite spread across the country, getting everybody together is quite difficult. Um, so we do train twice a year, and then we usually have two or three or more equine displays at shows each year as well. I was looking at, at the costumes, and the, everyone, of course, is in costume. Everyone who's who's on a horse, you're not, but everyone else is. How authentic are the costumes? I mean, how much de- how much attention do you pay to detail on that? Regular Anglora in particularly prides itself on its authenticity. So uh, all of the clothing that you see here has been handmade by members um, with fabrics and in the colours and weaves that would have been around in the period. A lot of time is spent in research and uh, testing and dyeing to see if we can recreate these colours and fabrics that we use. So do you use uh, old-fashioned traditional dyeing methods as well? Some do. A lot of the fabric you see here will be modern dyed, um, but we have got some dyers um, in, within the society that do recreate our own fabrics. And I, I always ask this because it's fascinating to know, what do you do the rest of the time? What's your day job? I'm a full-time mother, but I'm also a riding instructor. Um, so you'd be fascinated, actually. It is very interesting to find out what the reenactors do. Um, my husband it works in the medical society, medical uh, equipment manufacture. We've got teachers, lawyers, um, right down to the unemployed. Well, I'm going to go and talk to your husband, Mike. Um, I'm not quite sure if I can reach him because he's, he's sitting on top of a rather large horse, but I'll, I'll see how I go. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> can I reach you? So that's the helmet off, and that's um, that looks heavy. Is that heavy? It is very heavy. Yes, it's um, the, all of the equipment that you see, all of the um, military armour that you see Mike wearing today adds approximately three stone to his Gosh. weight. That, can you feel feel that? Is that exhausting to wear that? Um, it's fine when you first put it on. If, after you spend a couple of hours in it, it starts to drag down on your hips and your shoulders. Yeah. But um, we only wear it for a couple of hours a day at our events, but back then it would have been um, a very regular thing for, for men to wear this all day, even if they weren't on campaign. And tell me, uh, apart from the helmet, tell me what you've got on. Uh, currently I have got a, um, a Haubergen on, which is a long male shirt comprised of um, approximately 40,000 steel links, all interwoven. Um, it weighs about two and three quarters stone, um, so <laughs> it, uh, it, it can be felt. Um, underneath this would be a padded gambeson, which can be made up of uh, 30 to 50 layers of linen, which would um, basically be there to absorb any sort of percussive force from um, a shot coming in from a sword or an axe. Um, and then under that would just be my, my normal everyday dress, it would be my linen and wool tunics. And, and tell me a bit more about the, the, the chain mail. Am I correct in calling this chain mail? Um, it's 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 kind of a nickname that it has been um, it is given because of course it it, it it's not made of <laughs> anything resembling the chain. It, it's just the, uh, the the pattern that is given to it. Um, uh, in uh, uh, medieval references, it's called mail, which is spelled M A I M A I L L E. And it's you were saying it's um, it, it's all bits of metal linked together. Um, it, how do you do that? I mean, you, you've made that yourself, haven't you? Yes. Um, well, um, you can buy um, the individual links, and it's uh, it's a fairly simple pattern of uh, four into one, uh, what we call a flower pattern, where you have a central link interconnected to four other links, and then you just repeat the pattern to build up lines. And from that, you can build, you can make up squares of mail, uh, which you join together. Um, when you get enough panels, uh, you basically start building up the body and then the arms. Um, and depending on uh, how long you want it, how short, it can, it can range between, and also the, the, the size of the man, it can range between anywhere between 25 to 60,000 links. And how long do you reckon this would have taken you to make? 
Um, I've seen somebody make one in two weeks, flat, uh, but it's all that they did. Uh, but back then, um, uh, I mean, this was an expensive piece of kit. You would have had to have gone to a specialist blacksmith to um, uh, to uh, to get this, and they would have had to have individually made every link before it's been constructed. So, and back then, the the, the steel for uh, a male shirt was very very expensive and very rare. So it was very time consuming to put together. So you can you can look anywhere between six months to a year to fully fully complete one. And you very kindly made a Delaroche shield with the the three fishes on it. I did, I did, yes. Um, when we got when we got involved with um, with this uh, project, um, Pamela Hunt uh, gave us a lot of information about the Delaroche family. In in particular, the uh, the um, coat of arms for the Delaroche family. So I took it upon myself. I, I already had a heater shield, uh, which is a, a short shield which everybody is familiar with uh, if they think of King John and. Uh, William Marshall and uh, basically um, did my research on, on the coat of arms and, and painted it as such. It, look, it looks terrific. What, I know that you all make your own kit and it's very impressive that is too but there is quite an industry that's, that's grown up around reenactment group isn't there? Um, yes uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years uh, historical reenactment in the country has has really taken off uh, the society we've been uh, we belong to has been going for 30 plus years um, and is one of the largest uh, and probably the most accurate um, early medieval uh, historical societies in the country I mean we've got uh, an average of 700 active members uh, we've got groups in South Africa um, the United States and currently um, groups are forming on the continent in Spain so um, yes uh, uh, blacksmiths leather workers um, uh, pottery specialists anything that was involved in a, in a medieval uh, everyday craft is now being replicated on a, on a very very high production level to support this hobby Mike Harris of Lanska reenactment and if you're quick you can catch them at Kilgarren Castle on Sunday the 7th of August that's it for now. We've been putting together the app that will communicate with the tapestry when it goes on show, so we hope to bring you some news about that next month. Thanks as ever to the Heritage Lottery Fund for making Heritage Langham possible. And until next month, thanks to you for listening.